So, uh, as Gordon mentioned, uh, we're going to do two, Lord willing, we're going to do two uh, talks on uh, Newton's uh, interest in biblical uh, theology. Uh, the first one tonight will focus on uh, theology proper. And then uh, on May 3rd, we're going to look at Newton's interest in uh, biblical prophecy. So these are not, for Newton, separate. Uh, they're totally intertwined. But uh, just to sort of spread out this topic over two nights, that was a convenient way of dividing up the theme. Now, I, I want to begin by just uh, saying something about Newton as he is known in uh, popular culture. So if you know anything about Newton, you'll know that he worked in science. This is, by the way, the first uh, portrait of Newton. It shows him at the age of uh, 46, at the height of his powers, just after he published the Principia Mathematica. And I'll say something about the Principia Mathematica in a, in a couple minutes. So this is what, for most people, they think of when they think of Newton. They think that of him as someone who worked in science, uh, who wrote a very important book on physics, the most important book on physics, I would argue, the Principia Mathematica. He also did work in optics and what else? He invented uh, calculus. So he's very, very important to the history of science and to the way science is practiced uh, today. We're not going to spend much time talking about that well-known Newton. We're going to talk about another Newton who actually is not another Newton. It's the same person, but it's another side of Newton that is not as well known in uh, popular culture. Something else that people usually think of when they think of Newton is the apple. Uh, this is Wolsert Manor where Newton was born and there were apple trees there when he was uh, a young person and he tells uh, some of his friends late in life that he saw an apple fall when he was a young man and this gave him one of the inspirations for his understanding of universal gravity that the force that drew the apple towards the Earth is the same force that keeps the moon in orbit around the Earth. And in fact, that force is truly universal, which is why it's called the universal gravity. It exists everywhere in the universe. This was Newton's discovery. And this discovery allows us to do all kinds of things from uh, engin engineering applications to putting satellites into orbit, uh, etc. And don't let uh, people fool you when they say that Einstein makes uh, Newton uh, obsolete. Uh, that's not really true. For most daily applications, uh, Newton uh, still works uh, quite well. There actually is an apple tree at Wilsert Manor that dates back to Newton's lifetime. It blew down in uh, the early 19th century and seems to have rerouted. I won't say miraculously, but uh, it's still alive. It's still producing uh, fruit and, and leaves. Uh, and it's noted as one of uh, Britain's 50 most significant trees. And it has a little plaque beside it with Queen Elizabeth II's uh, name on it. So this is something that's very, very well known about Newton. And the Apple logo uh, on an, uh, an Apple computer actually derives from that story of the apple falling. We also know that Newton did work in optics. It was Newton who discovered that white light, rather counterintuitively, is not pure, but it's all color, right? So a, a pure ray of sunlight, it looks white, but it actually contains all color. And he was able to show this using a very, very simple tool. It was actually just a child's toy the prism. And he transforms this child's toy into a sophisticated scientific instrument. Uh, you'll see right here on the table beside him his reflecting telescope. So he invents a reflecting telescope uh, using a mirror rather than a lens. And this telescope today is called the Newtonian telescope. And probably the most famous example of a Newtonian telescope is the Hubble Space Telescope, which takes those wonderful pictures of uh, space. Newton ended up at the University of Cambridge when he was 18 years old. And by the time he was a fellow, he lived right here on the second floor, what the British call the first floor, what we in North America tend to call the, the second floor. And he had his own uh, private garden there. We don't know whether he had an apple tree there, but there is an apple tree there now, which descends from an apple tree at Woolsorp. Uh, 
Uh, he never married, uh, so he was a lifelong bachelor, and I think this is one of the reasons, uh, this is one of the explanations for why he wrote something like 10 million words in manuscript. That is the manuscripts that survived, because we know that he burned some before uh, his death. So this is the book that gave him most of his fame, the Principia Mathematica. And we see in the Principia Mathematica the inverse square law for universal gravitation and the three laws of motion. The third one is probably the most well-known. For every action, there is an opposite uh, and equal uh, reaction. And what he did rather brilliantly was he applied mathematics to physics. And so you can use mathematics uh, with physics uh, to calculate uh, the orbits of the planets, etc. And Newton does this in the Principia. That was published in 1687. The Optics is published in 1704. The Principia is published in Latin. The Optics, as you can see, was published in English. So this makes it accessible to all uh, English-speaking people, mostly in uh, Britain. Uh, whereas the earlier book uh, was published in Latin, and so it wasn't accessible to all uh, people in England because most people didn't know Latin, but it was accessible to scholars throughout Europe because Latin was the lingua franca of scholarship at that time. And in the optics, we see uh, articulations of his optical experiments with the prism and principles about what uh, light is, etc. Now this rather strange image right here is a painting that was painted in 1795 by William Blake. So William Blake is one of the uh, leading figures of the Romantic movement, Romantic with a capital R. And he re reacted rather negatively to Newton. And he did this, I would argue, largely on the basis of misinformation about Newton. Uh, Newton was interpreted by the Enlightenment, in particular the French Enlightenment, as a kind of cold, calculating person who wasn't really interested in, in uh, spiritual things. And you can see that uh, emblematized in this uh, painting right here. This is not what Newton looked like. He didn't have that kind of physique. He didn't have tight, curly, blonde hair. Uh, so it's an allegorical Newton. But you can see when you look at this image that this is a cold, calculating uh, rationalist. He's not looking up to heaven where God is. He's looking down to a geometrical diagram. So this is a very common depiction of Newton, uh, that he wasn't uh, spiritual. He was uh, a rationalist. Uh, he was only interested in mathematics. And God was uh, perhaps... Uh, in his, in his worldview, but rather distant. And we get this idea of a clockwork universe, that Newton invents a clockwork universe, where God creates the universe like a clock, winds it up, and then goes on a holiday. It's a very uh, common association with Newton, that Newton uh, goes with the clockwork universe. Uh, we'll come back to that a little later, uh, but I will show you that Newton uh, did not believe in a clockwork universe. In fact, he was opposed to it. Now that, that was 1795, William Blake. Newton died in 1727, and shortly after his death in 1731, this monument was erected uh, over his grave. And it was put together by people who knew him well. So you can see Newton there leaning on four books. And above him is a sphere, and above the sphere is an allegorical figure representing astronomy weeping because of uh, Newton's death. And down here you can see little uh, cherubs uh, doing various things that relate to Newton's work. So they're playing with one of his reflecting telescopes and they're weighing the planets on a scale, etc., uh, etc. Et but I want to draw your attention to those four books right there. What books are those? Well, the first one is the Principia. The second one is the Optics. So those are two books we've already looked at. And those are two books that people today are often familiar with. But what about the other two books? Well, the, second, the third book is a book of chronology. So when Newton was almost uh, in his last uh, um, weeks of life, he was finishing off uh, another book called The Chronology of Ancient Kingdoms Amended. And this was an attempt to uh, perfect the discipline of chronology, and he was interested in discovering the years that various kings reigned and that sort of thing in order 
for his chronology to link up with uh, biblical chronology. The book has an entire chapter devoted to uh, the Jerusalem temples. So he talks about the Jews, he talks about the Greeks and the Romans and the Persians, uh, etc., etc. The other book is Divinity. Divinity is an early modern way of saying theology. Right? So, those who knew Newton best knew that he was working in all of those areas as well as others. But society today has generally lost sight of that. However, over the last few decades, because the manuscripts have become accessible, uh, we're now uncovering this other aspect to Newton that he actually spent more time studying theology than he spent studying physics, mathematics, and optics. And we know this partly on the basis of a wealth of manuscripts which have uh, fortunately survived. So we're not going to talk about Newton uh, the scientist. In fact, Newton was not a scientist. I don't want to shock anyone. Um, Newton could not have been a scientist. There's a rather pedantic reason for that. The term scientist wasn't even coined until 1833, but more importantly, the role didn't exist. Rather, Newton was a natural philosopher, a philosopher of nature. And that very title suggests that the humanities and the sciences came together in that discipline in a way that they often don't today, unfortunately. So Newton wasn't a scientist in the modern sense. He wasn't a scientist, you know, with the white lab coat. That's a modern uh, role. Newton was instead uh, more like a Renaissance man. He was working in various different fields, and those fields included uh, physics as well as uh, theology. So we're going to talk about Newton as a theologian. And the two main themes that I want to focus on this evening, one is his biblical theology. What did Newton believe about the Bible? What were the results of his 60 plus year study, uh, 60 plus years study of the Bible? And secondly, a very common question that people ask is, okay, you say that Newton was working in science, we know that, and you also say that he was working in theology. What is the relationship, if any, between those spheres? Now, a very common conception today is that science and religion are not connected. There is a wall between them. And there are various types of people who'd want to say that, but certainly people with a more of a secular view, maybe don't like religion, want to suggest that science isn't associated with religion because uh, they think that maybe religious thinking might contaminate uh, science. Well, as we'll see, for Newton, the two are bound up together. He does not believe that they're separated. He's able to use terms like natural philosophy and religion and God, etc. So he's able to use the language, but if you look at the way he works, he combines these ideas uh, together. And the testimony of the manuscripts uh, shows us this. This is a rather trivial example, but it gives us some insight into Newton's mind. Because what we see here is a manuscript that was essentially a loose uh, sheet of paper that Newton wrote various things on. And they give us some insight into the range of his activities. So on this sheet of paper, you see mathematical physics, uh, Newton's work on currency. Newton was the uh, uh, warden and then the master of the Royal Mint of England, so, and he brought England through a recoinage. So he was a, a civil servant. That was one of his uh, roles. We see some theology and some ecclesiastical history. And right here you can see that he's written out some uh, words in Greek. He knew Greek. He was able to write and even speak Latin as fluently as he could speak uh, and write uh, English. So there's a lot of Latin in his manuscripts as well. Uh, here's a manuscript which is now in Jerusalem, in Israel, and it shows some notes that Newton was taking from various sources, including some uh, Jewish sources, Maimonides, the medieval philosopher, and you can see some Hebrew up there. Newton's Hebrew wasn't uh, exceptionally good, but he had a, a kind of a basic understanding of Hebrew, so you do see Hebrew in his writings as well. Now this slide and the next one uh, are, have, have very small uh, font, so you won't be able to see the detail, but that's not the point. I just want to show you how many theological manuscripts there are, right? So 
This list right here just gives the major theological manuscripts that are part of the National Library of Israel in uh, Jerusalem. And when we talk about Newton's uh, prophecy, Lord willing, in a month's time, uh, I will explain how those manuscripts ended up in Jerusalem and how appropriate it is that manuscripts that talk about the return of the Jews to Israel and that talk about Jerusalem end up in Jerusalem and they would not have ended up in Jerusalem had uh, Israel not become a nation again in modern times. Uh, this second slide shows some other manuscript repositories. So the Keynes manuscripts collected by the famous economist John Maynard Keynes uh, ended up at King's College, not my King's College unfortunately in Halifax, but King's College, Cambridge. Uh, the Babson manuscripts for many many years were in Massachusetts, but now they're just down the highway at the Huntington Library, and I'll say a little bit more about that in the next slide. And there are manuscripts at Cambridge, of course, uh, Andrews University, which is a Seventh-day Adventist uh, university just outside of uh, Chicago, uh, Texas, the Bodleian Library in Oxford, Trinity College, and Stanford. So, what about California? Well, there are three major, sorry, four major collections of Newton manuscripts in California. So the Huntington Library, which I just mentioned, and this is uh, where I am for, for this year. I'm on, on academic sabbatical uh, right now. And they have a, an excellent collection of Newton's manuscripts, Newton books, and even some books that were owned by Newton that have some annotations, dog ears, etc., etc. So scholars study those. Uh, the Clark Library, which is uh, a specialist uh, rare books collection uh, run by uh, UCLA. And the Carplay's Manuscript Museum, which is in Santa Barbara, just down the highway the other direction. And Stanford University also has some manuscripts. So even in California, we've got a, a really nice set of uh, manuscripts. And some of these are available in high resolution color scans. Others, you actually have to go to the museum uh, to study them. So, I'll show you some images, just so you have a sense of what these manuscripts look like. I'll show you some images from the Carplay's Manuscript Museum, which, as I said, is in Santa Barbara. And this one here, to begin with, gives you some insight into the way that Newton worked. He was quite uh, conscious about the cost of paper, and so he reused a lot of paper. And what you're looking at right here is a letter that someone wrote to him appealing uh, to him for uh, some help, employment, etc. And the letter is dated January 26, 1720. This is very valuable to scholars because we know that Newton's annotations on this manuscript must date to after the 26th of January, 1720. This is one of the ways we date Newton's manuscript. You can see the remnants of a red wax seal. This is the other side of that manuscript. And you can see the folds. And we also see the name of Newton and his address, St. Martin Street in London, where he moved in 1710. So even if we didn't have the date, we would know that this manuscript must date from after 1710 because that is when Newton moved to uh, St. Martin Street. So as I said, you can see the folds. This is a letter and envelope all in one. The letter's folded up and then it's sealed and then it's um, uh, mailed. And what is this manuscript? Well, uh, you can see discussions about uh, the Holy Spirit, etc. And what he's discussing here, uh, he's actually recording the views of some Trinitarians. And uh, this kind of serves as uh, part of his database. He would write out quotations from books, and then he would be able to turn to those quotations when he needed them for uh, other purposes. Now, as you can see, the manuscripts are not always in great shape. Uh, this one right here, which includes his uh, attempts to calculate the length of the cubit, and he's interested in that. Why is he interested in that? Because he wants to be able to reconstruct the plan of the Jerusalem temple. So you need to get the, the length of the cubit right. Is it 18 inches? Is it 21 inches? So he plays with the Egyptian cubit, the Roman cubit, etc. But you can see that it's burnt. Now, why, why would that have happened? Well, Newton often is working at night. There are no electrical lights in the 17th and 18th century. He's working by candlelight. So occasionally, and you know, they had these big frilly sleeves, they would knock over uh, candles. 
And fortunately, most of the time, he's able to tamp out the fire uh, before uh, there, are serious, there is serious damage. Uh, but every once in a while, uh, things could get catastrophic and he would lose uh, quite a few uh, pages. And this, I would put to you, is the equivalent of having a hard drive crash today. So you can imagine how upsetting uh, that would be. But it's just a, a, a byproduct of the way he worked. So unfortunately, we've lost some of the text, but we have most of it. So these are mostly uh, theological papers. As I said, he's attempting to discover uh, the length of the cubit. Uh, this one is uh, also in the same light. You can see some Greek there and um, some Hebrew at, at the bottom. Okay, now, Newton, as with many natural philosophers in the early modern period, believed that if you studied nature, you were studying the works of God. And one of the main reasons why they believe this is because the Bible confirms this. So if you look at this passage from Psalm 104, O Lord, how manifold are thy works, and wisdom thou hast made them all. The earth is full of thy riches. People like Newton, looking at passages like this, uh, it confirmed their belief that when they studied nature, when they studied the cosmos, they were studying the handiwork of God. So to work in what we would now call science was, in effect, an act of devotion at the same time. Now, in addition to that, Newton looked at passages like Psalm 104, but also, more importantly, Psalm 119, which begins with a statement about the glory of the heavens. They would, uh, Newton and, and those of like mind, would look at passages like that, which tell us that the heavens are declaring the glory of God. The firmament showeth its handiwork, etc., etc. So when you're looking at the heavens, God is speaking to you through the beauty and the design of nature. So again, what this meant for Newton and for others like him in the 17th and 18th century, Robert Boyle, who's one of the founders of modern chemistry, is, a, is another example, is that when they're studying nature, they're studying creation. And so this connects the study of nature with their religion. I'll give you an example of this. This is a, a manuscript which is now at the University of Cambridge. As you can see, this one also ha has suffered uh, some kind of uh, burning. Uh, but there's a little phrase up here in Latin that he added to a paragraph. And I'm going to come back to this a little bit later. Uh, in a manuscript that talks about God and time and space. It's a very, very profound manuscript. What is that little bit that he added? Well, here it is right here. Deus ex operibus cognoscitor. God is known from his works. Now, there are two th things I want to say about this. First of all, this is an example of what is called natural theology. So in the early modern period, there were people like Newton who believed that, as I said, if you study nature, you could see the work uh, of God in nature. So this is called natural theology. And it's related to what we now call the design argument. You can see design in nature, and that implies that there is a designer with a capital D, whom we call uh, God. That's the first point. The second point is that this process of inferring God from nature is what we call inductivism. It's empiricism, and it's the same method that he used in science, right? So, when he's developing his theory of gravity, what is he doing? He's looking at examples of the motions of planets and comets. He takes all that messy data and he brings it all together and he infers a general principle from that. And that principle is the inverse square law. So you can see that he's using this inductive method in both his study of the Bible, his study of uh, nature with respect to natural theology, and his uh, science. So methodologically, we see linkages in between different areas of Newton's work. This is a much more complicated uh, statement, so I'll, I'll explain it a little bit as a, after I've uh, read it. This is also at Cambridge University li uh, Library. This is a manuscript that relates to 
uh, his optics. He did add some theological notes in later editions of the optics. Metaphysical arguments are intricate and understood by few. Newton didn't like metaphysics. The argument which all men are capable of understanding and by which the belief of a deity has hitherto subsisted in the world is taken from the phenomena. This again is inductivism. We see the effects of a deity in the creation and thence gather the cause and therefore the proof of a deity and what are his properties belongs to, he first wrote natural, crossed that out, and then wrote experimental philosophy. Tis the business of this philosophy, and he's essentially talking about science there, to argue from the effects to their causes till we come at the first cause and not to argue from any cause to the effect till the cause as to its being and quanti quality is sufficiently discovered. So what he's saying here is that the way that you proceed if you want to understand God from nature is you study nature and then you infer the wisdom and the glory of God uh, from nature. So again, it's an inductive process. It's the same process that he uses to discover the inverse square law and the three laws of motion, as well, of course, as his understanding of light and his optical experiments. Okay, we're going to shift gears a little bit and say something about his theology proper. This is a very important manuscript. It's 471 words long. How do I know? Because I counted the words. Although we have a bit of a joke in the uh, Newton uh, community about whether you count struck through words as negatives. So let's just say around 470 words. Uh, what is this manuscript? Well, I'm going to send around a transcription of it for you. Thank you. This is a list of 12 articles or 12 principles, 12 statements about God and Christ. And what he wants to do is he wants to determine the relationship between God and Christ. Newton early on in the 1670s when he was a young man in his 30s began to realize that the doctrine of the Trinity is not taught in the Bible. Now to put this into perspective the Trinity in the 17th century, as it is for many Christians today, is the chief doctrine of orthodoxy. Right? To reject that is to be considered a heretic. Uh, but this is exactly what Newton did. Now, he never went fully public with this. He, he hints at it later in his life, in his, in his Principia. But for the most part, he kept this uh, private, although he did preach to people that uh, he knew in private. Okay, so let's look at some examples from this. And I'm referring to this as Newton's biblical Unitarian theology. So when I say Unitarian, I just mean that Newton believed that God is one person, not three persons. So don't confuse this with the modern group Unitarian Universalism, uh, which um, is you know, a very liberal group, and they include people who aren't even believers. This is referring to his view of God. So Article 1. And you can see this on your handout. There is one God, the Father. He first wrote eternal, then he crossed that out and replaced it with ever-living, omnipresent, omniscient, almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. So when you look at this, the, the handout, you'll see that I've underlined the portions that are from the Bible. So it's laced with uh, biblical language. This first article right here alludes to 1 Timothy 2 and 5, which... Uh, Gordon read for us uh, earlier. And this was a very important passage for Newton because he believed that it showed that the Father alone is God. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man uh, Christ Jesus. So he believed that Jesus was not God. At least he was not God in a substantial or essentialistic uh, sense. He believed that Christ could be called God, as Christ is maybe four or five times in the New Testament, but only in an honorary sense, not in the sense of Trinitarianism. You also see that he's alluding to the opening words of the Apostles' Creed. If you read the Apostles' Creed, you'll see that it's entirely biblical, although it doesn't, it's not part of the Bible, but it's based on uh, biblical teachings. Article 2, the, the Father is the invisible God whom no 
eye has seen or can see, all other beings are sometimes visible. So as he moves on to articles 2, 3, and following, you see that what he's doing is he's showing some distinctions between God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. There's certain things that are true of God that are not true of Christ. And so God is invisible, other beings are sometimes visible, and this includes uh, Jesus Christ. So, this passage is influenced by Colossians 1, verse 15. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. So he interprets that to mean that Christ is not God. Christ is not the invisible God. He is the image of the invisible God. Now, I say that Newton interpreted it that way. I think that the verse actually does uh, say that. Also, 1 Timothy 1, 17, and 1 Timothy 6 and uh, 16. Now, he does this in other places. So, a manuscript which is now held in the National Library of Israel in Jerusalem has another list of 12 points. They're slightly different, but the basic idea here is that only the Father is God. God on the, script, on the scriptures is never used to, he crosses that out and then writes, the word God is nowhere in the scriptures used to signify more than one of the three persons at once. This manuscript probably dates from the 1670s when Newton is sort of coming out of Trinitarianism. So you can see that he's still kind of using some of the language of Trinitarianism even though he's beginning to realize that the idea of three co-equal persons is not biblical. So then he goes on to say, the word God put absolutely without particular restriction to the Son or Holy Spirit that always signify the Father from one end of the scriptures to the other. Whenever it is said in the scriptures that there is but one God, it is meant of the Father. So he concludes that references to the one God only refer to the Father. Now that is a non-Trinitarian perspective, right? Because in the doctrine of the Trinity, the one God is three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Newton comes to reject this, and he rejects this not on philosophical grounds, but on biblical grounds. It is the proper epithet of the Father to be called Almighty. For God Almighty, for by God Almighty, we always understand the Father. Yet this is not to limit the power of the Son, for he doeth whatsoever he seeth the Father do, etc., etc., using language that comes from the New Testament. So, he doesn't believe that Jesus is a mere man, just a, a, a really good teacher. He believes that Jesus is literally the Son of God, but he does not believe that Jesus and uh, the Father are of the same substance in uh, the one God. So he comes to reject that, and he rejects that almost certainly by the 1670s, so about a decade before he writes the Principia. And by the way, there is a legend out there that Newton only turned to theology late in his life, after he wrote the Principia, after he wrote the Optics, and this legend goes right back to the early 18th century, uh, 19th century rather. And the motivation behind it is to kind of uh, erect a wall around his science uh, so that the theology doesn't have anything to do with it, but also to argue that, well, that's what you do when you're uh, older, you're soft, you know, in your dotage, you turn to theology. Unfortunately for that argument, and fortunately for historical truth, we have the manuscripts, and we see that much of Newton's best theology predates the Principia, which was published in 1687. Uh, much of his best work in theology and much of his best work in science was done when he was young, which is what we would uh, expect. So that is a myth. Okay, so that's uh, the Trinity. Now, Newton, as I said, uh, the model I'm presenting is that he's coming out of orthodoxy. He never completely comes out in every respect. So some uh, of you might be thinking, what did he think about the pre-existence of Christ? Well, it seems that for most of his life, he did retain a belief in the pre-existence. But as he got older, and as he began to uh, read the works of the Polish brethren, otherwise called the Socinians, who don't believe in the pre-existence of Christ, that is to say, they don't believe in the literal pre-existence, they believe that Christ pre-existed in the mind of God uh, only, you can see Newton begins to vacillate. 
and he's not entirely sure whether he wants to claim that that is a doctrine that has to be uh, accepted. So there's a gradual retreat of the importance of the pre-existence, although maybe he continued to believe in it up to the end of his life, it's very, very difficult. Unfortunately, Newton wasn't writing for 21st century uh, theologians, he was only, or scholars, he's only writing for himself and some of his friends. So he doesn't give us all the answers to all the questions we might want to ask. But another question that we might want to ask is what did he believe about the soul? This one's a much more complicated question because he, he does seem to shift around a little bit, but he certainly was unorthodox on the soul. So in the 1690s, he penned a manuscript, which is now uh, down in South Central LA in the Clark Library, which includes a section where he quotes passages from the Bible uh, to argue that when you're dead, you're unconscious, and you're not conscious again until the resurrection. I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, which are, uh, uh, of them which are asleep, that sorrow, not even as other uh, which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For the Lord shall descend from heaven, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet them in the air. Okay, yeah, this is actually out of order, so let me do it this way. I'm going to do it backwards. Um, were not men greatly prejudiced, they would consider such texts of Scripture as these. In death there is no remembrance of thee. In the grave who shall give thee thanks? Psalm 6 and 5. Shall thy loving kindness be declared in the grave, thy wonders in the dark, and thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? Psalm 88, 11 and 12. The dead praise not the Lord, neither any that go down into silence. Psalm 115 and 17. The dead know not anything. There is no work, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave. Ecclesiastes 9 5 and 10. The grave cannot praise thee, death cannot celebrate thee. Isaiah 38 verse 18. God hath begotten us again unto a, live, a lovely hope, that's I think meant to be lively, by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance in heaven. 1 Peter 1, 3, 4, which is as much to say that without the resurrection there is no hope, nor no inheritance in heaven, and to the same purpose speaks uh, Saint Paul and then the passage that I read initially. So what we see here again is somewhat similar to what we saw with the Trinity, that he's beginning to move sharply away from uh, the orthodox idea that everyone has a soul that is in us, that departs from the body and goes to heaven at death. Newton moves away from this view, looks at passages in the Bible that confirm that when we're dead, we're unconscious, we don't exist. He still seems to be thinking in terms of after the resurrection, people going uh, to heaven, although he also believes the saints will spend time on earth. So he hasn't quite let go of the idea of going to heaven, but he certainly has let go of this idea that when you die, you immediately go to heaven. So he believes the intermediate state between death and resurrection is a, a state of unconsciousness, uh, of non-existence. So that's roughly where he was in the 1690s. Uh, we're still working on his theology. I'm working with another scholar on a paper on this uh, uh, topic, his theology of, of, of the soul. So people who believe that there is no mortal soul are called mortalists. People who believe that there is an immortal soul uh, are sometimes called immortalists, right? So Newton uh, begins to take the view that uh, we don't have this sort of platonic soul which uh, many people believe uh, that we have. There's a couple other passages that uh, hint at this. Well, there, there are a couple, there's a couple other passages that I'm going to show you tonight. There are many other passages. We don't have time to look at them all. Uh, here's a note that a Scottish mathematician who was visiting Newton in May 1694 wrote, not a separate existence of the soul, but a resurrection with a continuation of memory is the requirement of religion. This seems maybe a little bit enigmatic, so what is uh, Gregory saying, or what was Newton saying, because this is a record of what Newton said. Well, one common argument in favor of the immortal soul is that you need to have an immortal soul for your personality to continue to exist, right? So through your life, 
and then after your death, when your body is destroyed, your personality continues, and then in the resurrection, the soul rejoins the body, etc., etc. So that's an argument that's made by people who believe in what is called natural immortality, that we're naturally immortal. So Newton's saying, we don't need a soul for our personality continue, to continue because God holds our memories. He's omnipotent. He's, he's, he's uh, infinitely powerful. He holds our memories of who we are, and that's who, you know, what we are, our personalities based on our memories, etc. And he can recreate those. Now, if you think about it, what Newton is saying is that if you believe in a powerful God who has complete sovereignty and complete dominion, you don't need a soul. And in fact, this is very consistent with Newton's thinking because Newton comes to believe in a very powerful God who is always sovereign over every event uh, throughout uh, time. And so there is something that God can't destroy if there is such a thing as an immortal soul. And for this, Newton is un, uh, an unpalatable uh, idea. I've got one more example on the soul. That the resurrection from the dead is called living again, and therefore between death and the resurrection, men do not live. Very logical. That men are rewarded at Christ's coming, not before. So he was concerned with this idea that the soul goes to heaven. That's a reward. But the judgment doesn't come until later, till the resurrection. So Newton feels that this is backwards and concludes that that doesn't make sense. So there is no reward, there is no immortality until the resurrection and until judgment. So he's coming out of the orthodox position, may not have completely let go of every aspect of it. We're not sure because we don't have a complete knowledge of uh, his theology over time, but we have these tantalizing uh, clues. The Trinity, the soul, are the two most important sort of litmus tests of orthodoxy Okay, we want to try to wind down in a few minutes, and um, there's some material on some more profound topics that I'll just uh, touch on uh, very briefly. So I showed you a manuscript earlier that had part of the bottom burned away. Uh, this is the manuscript that we refer to as Tempus et Locus. It doesn't actually have a title, uh, but we uh, give it this term. Tempus et Locus means time and space. Newton was very interested in space from the point of view of his physics, but he was also interested in space from the point of view of his understanding of God's omnipresence. So here again, you can see how his science and religion come together. So he writes a series of points or questions in this manuscript. They're, uh, they're originally written in, in Latin. These, these are uh, English translations of those notes. That the substance of God is not present in all places or that the Jews more correctly called God place, Macomb, by the way, Hopefully you're, hopefully you're not too shocked by this. Uh, that is a spelling mistake in Hebrew. That's how you spell uh, Macomb. Um, so he spelled it with a calf, not with a uh, kof and the, uh, the vav there. That is the, these, even Newton made spelling mistakes. Uh, that is a substance essential to all places in which we are placed, and as the apostle says, in which we live and move and have our being. That is an allusion to Acts 17 and 28. Is it more agreeable to reason that God's eternity should be all at once, totem symbol, snapshot view of eternity, or that his duration is more correctly designated by the names Jehovah? And, and then he does something very interesting. He takes this expression, ho on kai ho ein kai ho erkomenos, which is in Revelation 1 verse 8, he who is and who was and is to come, and he makes it one word. He just joins it all together as a title of God. He's interested in, in the titles of God, the names of God, and what they might tell about his um, his being. And what he believes is that God is present uh, throughout all eternity, almost as if God sort of fills uh, time. So he's a very high view of God. Now, I want to, uh, one of the last things I want to talk about is uh, the appendix that Newton added to the Principia. When Newton first published the Principia in 1687, it had one reference to God and one reference to the Bible. This is a 1687 edition. When he published the second edition in 1713, he had an appendix. It's about 1,450 words in the Latin. Yes, I did count 
the words. Um, and the first edition, and then the second edition is a little bit longer because he added to it. And this is a draft of this text. He called it the General Scolium. And 58% of this text, the middle section, is pure theology. What is it doing there? This is uh, one of the published versions of that text. Well, what I did is I took the text in English and put it into Wordle, and this is what came out. Can anyone see what the dominant theme of the general scolium is? God. And yes, he does believe in one God, and there's an allusion to one God. You can see also that he's talking about planets, etc., etc. So, he begins the theological section. After talking about the solar system, he says, this most beautiful system of the sun, planets, and comets could only proceed from the counsel and dominion of an intelligent and powerful being. And if the fixed stars are the centers of other like systems, these being formed by the likewise council must be subject to the dominion of one, and he meant that in a non-Trinitarian sense, not a three-in-one God, but the Father only, especially since the light of the fixed stars is of the same nature with the light of the sun, and from every system light passes into all other systems. Well, here we see how Newton's very strict version of monotheism relates to his physics, because he believes if you have one God who creates everything, you're going to have a unified solar system, you're going to have a unified cosmos, the laws of nature are going to be the same everywhere. Whereas in a polytheistic system, you might expect that, you know, you have a god who is a god of a certain ballywick and principality who has his own laws and that sort of thing. So you can see how the monotheism relates to his, um, his physics and his understanding of gravitation. One of his followers produced this chart showing the beautiful system that he describes, the comets and the planets, and there's an English translation of the text we just looked at. And then he goes on, he does something that many people found quite peculiar. He talks about the nature of this God, and he describes him as a God of absolute dominion, and he begins to use a biblical language, the God of Israel, the God of gods, the Lord of lords, etc. And one of the things he wants to say is that the word God is a relative term. Now here we see Newton hinting at his anti-Trinitarianism in a public text. This is the only time he did it. 1713 and then in the third edition of the Mercipia, 1726. I'll just very briefly outline his argument. What he's saying is that Trinitarians, when they see the word God used in the Bible, they take that word to denote substance. So when that term God is used of Christ, they take it to mean that Christ is being described as having the same substance as the Father as in the Trinity. Instead, he says, no, it's a relative term. It's defined by its relations. So when you say God of Israel, that's a relative term. God's not just God you know, in, 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 in infinity, etc. He is God of something. Right? He's God of Israel, he's God of his people, uh, etc. He has a dominion. And he says in this text that a God that doesn't have dominion is not a real God. Who are those gods? Those are the false gods of the Gentiles. Those are idols. They don't have dominion, so they're not real gods. So his notion of God is directly connected to his notion of rule and sovereignty. God is the absolute uh, monarch. So he moves away from this Trinitarian conception, which is based on Greek philosophy and notions of substance. The relationship between Christ and God is not one of substance for Newton, but rather it's one of shared sovereignty and derived sovereignty in the case of uh, Jesus. And so he quotes some passages where he says, look, you can see that uh, in the Bible, Psalm uh, 82, for example, the Hebrew judges are called Elohim, they're called gods, but that doesn't make them God a very God in the sense of the Nicene Creed, uh, they're representing God. So they have that title in a relative sense or uh, in an official uh, sense. Okay, there's more on this, but uh, let's just move through uh, to the end. Some other hints of his anti-Trinitarianism, that God is a one indivisible person, God is one deus et unis. It's all there. He doesn't come out you know, explicitly, but there were people in Newton's uh, lifetime who actually recognize that he is attacking the Trinity. So this is the most famous book in the history of science, and there is an implicit attack on the Trinity uh, in it. Now, I mentioned the clockwork universe. I want to now debunk Wikipedia, if that's okay with everyone. Um, this uh, text, by the way, doesn't 
read this way anymore because one of my colleagues, a group of his students, corrected Wikipedia. But essentially this reference to the clockwork universe used to say that Newton invents the clockwork universe. Uh, in fact, he doesn't. And I'm going to show you a statement made by one of his followers. The notion of the world's being a great machine going on without the interposition of God as a clock continues to go without the assistance of a clockmaker is the notion of materialism and fate and tends under pretense of making God a supramundane intelligence to exclude providence and God's government and reality out of the world. So his worry is that if you take this view of the clockwork universe, the idea that God creates or makes a clock, winds it up and then takes away his hands and goes on a holiday, that this uh, is not the God of the Bible, because the God of the Bible is continuously sovereign at all times, doesn't go on a holiday, is uh, superintending, uh, even though he gives us free will, everything that happens, happens in the domain of his sovereignty. So the Newtonians, Newton and his immediate followers, reject the clockwork universe, yet ironically, it's associated uh, with uh, his name. At the end of uh, the optics, as he did with the Principia, he includes some theological notes. And this is very interesting. And one of the things he says uh, is that if natural philosophy, that is to say science in all its parts, by pursuing this method, the inductive method, shall at length be perfected, the bounds of moral philosophy will also be enlarged. For so far as we know by natural philosophy what is the first cause, what power he has over us, and what benefits we receive from him, so far our duty towards him as well as that towards one another will appear to us by the light of nature. What is he referring to there? He's referring to what Jesus in the New Testament calls the two greatest commandments, loving God and loving neighbor. So what he's saying is that science should have an ethical center. Right? So people who say that science shouldn't have anything to do with ethics, it's com completely separate from ethics. Well, Newton didn't agree with that. Uh, he believed that, uh, that love, um, ultimately love of neighbor and love of God, should be part of uh, science. And he concludes his optics uh, with um, a critique of idolatry and a reference to the original religion of the sons of Noah. And for many people, this is really, really obscure. Uh, but there it is. This is an annotated copy of the end of the Mercipia that is now held at uh, the Huntington Library, just down the 118 and the 210. And it lists the seven precepts of the sons of Noah, uh, which include the belief in the one God. This is a traditional Jewish belief that Gentiles uh, should uphold these seven precepts, even though they are not uh, Jews. Uh, so there's a transcription of that. So I want to conclude now. We've come back to the Principia, and we've talked a little bit about the relationship between Newton's uh, theology and his science. I want to end on that note. We've given you some examples of his uh, theology. But again, a question that is constantly raised is, what is the connection between his theology and his science? Well, when a young clergyman named Richard Bentley wrote to Newton, a few years after the Principia was uh, published uh, to help him with a series of lectures that he was revising for publication that were going to include the design argument. Now remember the design argument is the idea that you look at nature, you see design, and you infer, again that's inductivism, you infer from design that there is a designer with a capital D. So Newton wrote back to him and he said, Dear Richard Bentley, when I wrote my treatise about our system, that's the Principia, I had an eye upon which pr on such principles as might work with considering men for the belief of a deity, and nothing can rejoice me more than to find it useful for that purpose. The diurnal, that is to say, daily rotations of the sun and the planets, as they could hardly arise from any cause purely mechanical, he believes God is involved, they seem to make up that harmony in the system which was the effect of choice rather than of chance. So what he's saying is that when he wrote the Principia, he was hoping that people would see in it further evidence for the creative hand of God at work, further evidence of uh, design. And Newton, again, believes, uh, in addition to that, that the same methods that one uses in studying uh, the Bible and studying uh, the frame of the world, as he uses uh, the term right here, um, that you use the same uh, methods. Why? Because he believes that God 
ultimately reveals himself in two books, the book of Scripture and the book of nature. You remember we mentioned Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God. That for Newton is, and for many others in his time, is the book of nature. Now, if God does reveal himself in both those ways, and the revelation of the book of nature, of course, is very general, it's not specific, doesn't give us, you know, detailed understanding of the atonement and that sort of thing. But if that is the case, Newton believed that is the case, then these two spheres are not going to contradict because God is the God of order and not confusion. So therefore, there should be harmony between the book of nature and the book of scripture, that is to say between science and religion, if there is a conflict, that conflict arises because of our uh, erroneous interpretation of either the scripture or the um, of, of nature, that is to say in science. And he says something similar here in the manuscript which is in uh, Jerusalem. So in his Principia, in the general scolium, he concludes the theological section by saying, and thus much concerning God, he's talked about God, to discourse of whom from the appearances of things, from phenomena, does certainly belong to natural philosophy, that is to say, what we now call science. So the principle of God, the principle of God the creator, Newton says, should be and is for him a part, in fact, the central part, the central goal of science. So ultimately for Newton there is no division between science and religion. I want to end with a little uh, commercial right here. Um, the Newton Project, of which I'm a member of the editorial board, founded in 1998. We've received a lot of money, several million dollars worth of money over the, the last uh, decade and a half or so. Um, but the money ran out just before we finished tra transcribing the manuscripts. We've got a, a few hundred folios uh, left to tra transcribe. People ask me, how much does it cost? It costs about $20 a page uh, to transcribe them. If anyone's interested in donating to this project, uh, we can provide uh, U.S. Uh, tax receipts. And finally, if you're interested in following up on uh, Newton's uh, theology, please visit uh, these uh, three websites. You will find on the first website, this one here, uh, millions, literally millions of words on theology and you can search them using the search uh, engine, uh, etc. And so what the miracle of the internet has allowed us to do is to bring these private manuscripts uh, to the public in uh, a way that allows people to access, uh, access uh, Newton's theology, both uh, the common uh, people and also uh, scholars who study Newton. So, I'm done. <laughs>